So uh, welcome. My name is Joseph Chen. I'm the director of CCKS, um, the Center for Critical Korean Studies here at UCI. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get started with today's programs, I just want to make a few announcements. Um, we have, uh, this is the first in um, our recent books in Korean studies colloquium. We'll have, uh, the second event is on the 27th, uh, uh, which is, uh, hey, Young, help me out. Is it, was it Tuesday? I can't remember. Tuesday. Tuesday. And then it was Tuesday and Friday or is it Tuesday and yes, Thursday? Friday. It, so it's uh, the 27th, uh, Tuesday at this time, 12, uh, and that's uh, Dave Fedman. His book, Seeds of Control, uh, Japan's Empire of Forestry in Colonial Korea with Vanessa Baker. Um, and then the 30th, the Friday, also at, at noon, um, uh, Elizabeth Sun's book, Embodied Reckonings, Comfort Women, Performance and Trans-Pacific Redress with Tara Rodman. And then uh, Yoo Jung Oh's book, Pop City, Korean Popular Culture and the Selling of Place with Jenna Kim. So uh, those are coming up. I've also uh, want to announce that we're having um, on uh, Sunday, November 15th at 4 p.m., uh, my colleague uh, here at UCI has written a, uh, a Zoom play. Uh, it's called Pandemit. Um, and it'll be, again, Sunday, November 15th at 4 p.m. There'll be a live uh, Zoom reading um, of, of the play. Um, and then, uh, we have a, a number of other events, uh, just the CCKS um, newsletter just went out today. Uh, and so we have a lot of exciting things um, planned for this, uh, uh, for this quarter uh, and beyond. It's lovely to have you all here. This is our first official event of the fall, although we've had some things um, over the summer and gotten some time to sort of get used to this uh, new, new normal of life on Zoom. Um, I wanted to say something very quickly about the recent books colloquium, which is we usually have it in the spring. We actually had this already all planned for the spring and we obviously had to cancel it. Um, but it's an end of the year thing and it's really kind of meant to celebrate um, some real you know, impressive and important achievements uh, in our field. And so uh, I'm really happy today to be starting this off. Um, maybe it's, it's, it's good to start off the year with uh, in this kind of celebratory note um, especially considering the sort of uh, the seriousness of the circumstances that surround us. Um, uh, and I'm, so I'm really happy that we could kind of all get together and, and meet this way. I was telling the speakers beforehand, we usually like to, you know, have them feed, you know, have a nice dinner uh, and fly them out and, and, and have a sort of lovely sense of community that takes place over the course of the day. Uh, but it's better, I think, to break it up into a series of, um, of, of individual panels just for the, for the format. Um, this, uh, the other thing that's uh, this, uh, is sort of celebratory about this, this, um, this event is that it's usually the last thing our postdoc does for us uh, at the end of the year. Um, and fortunately, because of the timing, our postdoc from last year overlaps into this year. Um, and so we were uh, able to make this event happen um, in the fall. Um, she is uh, actually the one that organized uh, this whole event all three days, and she's actually going to be a respondent as well um, on the first um, uh, first first panel. Her name is Hegyun uh, Hegyun Kwan. Uh, she is uh, the 2019-2020 CC and 2021 CCKS <laughs> postdoctoral fellow. She holds a BA and MA in Korean literature and theater from Sogang University and a PhD in theater and performance studies from UCLA. Her research areas include gender studies, fashion theory, post-colonial studies, and Korean performance studies. Her doctoral dissertation, Performing Masquerade, the Politics of K-Beauty in South Korean Literary and Popular Culture from Japanese Colonialism to ne Neoliberalism, investigates how young women's, uh, Korean, young Korean women's beauty practices have produced new modes of femininity and empowered women's agency, especially in the context of everyday life and media representation from the Japanese colonial period to the neoliberal era. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Hegyang, who's going to introduce um, the panelists for today. OK, thank you, Joe. Uh, so today we have two presenters, uh, Kristen Klein and her book published in 2020, uh, Cold War Cosmopolitanism, Period Style in 1950s, Korean Cinema, and Suzy Wu's book framed by war Korean children and women at the crossroads of the US empire published in 2019. 
So first of all, uh, uh, let me introduce our first presenter, Christina Klein. She's associate professor in the Depar Department of English and director of American Studies at Boston College. Her articles uh, have been published in numerous journals such as Journal of Korean Studies and Transnational Cinemas. Uh, in 2003, her first book called Orientalism, Asia in the Middle Row, Imagination from 1945 to 1961 uh, was, pu uh, was published and her second book published this year called War Cosmopolitanism uh, explores the impact of the US military presence and American cultural diplomacy efforts on post-war Korean film style with a focus on the work of the Korean film director, Han Young Mo. Uh, please welcome Professor Klein. Thanks, Hei Kyung. Um, thank you for that nice introduction and thank you all for inviting me to be here and to share my work. I'm only sorry that I can't be here in person and we all can't be together in person um, and see everybody. And, um, and thanks to all the audience members for coming as well. Um, I have a slideshow that I am going to share um, so I'm going to disappear and you can look at the slides for while I give my presentation. All right. Um, so this book began about 10 years ago when I watched Madam Freedom, a 1956 film directed by Han Hyung Mo. I was supposed to be writing a book on contemporary Asian cinema and its relationship to Hollywood. And I was taking a bit of a deep dive into South Korean film. I kept coming across references in the scholarship to Madam Freedom as the most famous film of the post-Korean War period. And so I decided to take a little detour and watch it. Uh, the film tells the story of a professor's wife who takes a job in a Western luxury goods shop to supplement her husband's salary. The decision immerses her in Seoul's emerging new society of dance halls, cafes, and consumer goods. And before long, she is going on dates with her handsome young neighbor and embarking on a full-blown affair with her, her boss's husbands. I was so transfixed by the film that I lost my interest in the book I was supposed to be writing. Instead, I started watching as many of Han's films as I could get my hands on. As an American studies person, I was drawn to Madame Freedom because it was simultaneously familiar and foreign to me. On the one hand, the film's style was clearly indebted to that of classical Hollywood cinema, and it looked similar in many ways to American films of the 1940s and 50s. It had analytical editing, gloriously sweeping camera movements, a rich soundtrack of contemporary Western songs that developed the character and themes, chic costumes, and elaborate decor. On the other hand, Madame Freedom was clearly rooted in the contemporary conditions of post-war South Korea, which I was, with which I was less familiar. I suspected I was missing some of the nuances of meaning attached to the husband's job as a scholar of the Korean language and the subplot about smuggling. And I was astounded by the behavior of the main character who so brazenly violated the gender norms of what I knew was still a, strong, a strongly Confucian society. I also didn't understand how such a technically accomplished film could have been produced a mere three years after the end of the Korean War when the country was still struggling to rebuild and its people were among the poorest in the world. I suspected that the film style had something to do with the waging of the Cold War. In the 1950s, Korea hosted tens of thousands of American GIs on a network of military bases that spanned the country. And it received an influx of millions of dollars in US aid and, and supplies. Although there weren't any American characters in Madame Freedom, I could feel a shadowy American presence just outside the film's frame. I became interested in the idea of Korean agency in relation to America. I was intrigued by the idea that cultural producers like Han were using the American presence in their country for their own purposes, and that America was being acted upon by Koreans rather than the other way around. As I began researching, I also became convinced that the 1950 to 1950s deserved more attention as a unique moment in Korea's cultural history one that many scholars skipped over as they jumped from the end of Japanese colonialism in 1945, directly to Park Chung-hee's coup of 1961. I wanted to dig deeper into this period that historian John Lee has called a forgotten decade and characterized as an emancipatory moment that was expunged by Park's military rule. So who was the director of this fabulous film? Han Young-mo was born in 1917 into an affluent Christian family 
and artistic youth. He attended art school in Japanese occupied Manchuria before moving to Seoul in 1941 to work in the colonial era film industry. He studied cinematography in Japan for two years and directed his first film in 1949, soon after Korea's independence and the end of the US military occupation. With the outbreak of the Korean War, he began shooting documentary war footage for the Department of Defense and became a correspondent, correspondent for a US news service. Han's career took off after the war and he became an important player in the emerging commercial film industry. Madam Freedom was a very profitable box office hit that demonstrated that a well-made Korean film could lure audiences away from Hollywood imports and generate a substantial return for investors. The film helped launch what later became known as the golden age of Korean cinema, in which filmmakers produced a growing number of high quality films that explored Korea's experience of rapid social modernization. Although Han would continue to make films until 1967, his most creative and commercially successful period stretched from 1949, one year after the end of the Korean War, to 1961, the year of Park's military coup. The post-war 1950s was really his moment. Han specialized in making women's pictures, films that foregrounded women's experiences and perspectives. He was deeply interested in women's relationship to modernity and in women as barometers of the sweeping changes that post-war society was going through. Han's, film often, Han's films often revolve around relatively affluent Korean women who live ostentatiously modern lives and challenge patriarchal gender norms in various ways. Hand of Destiny tells the story of a North Korean spy who lives alone outside of any male dominated family structure in a lavishly furnished Western style apartment and who takes a lover and supports him financially, including buying him new clothes. Han's characters often have professional careers. The heroine of men versus women is a doctor. Pure love features an airline stewardess at a time when that was the epitome of a glamorous job. And Because I Love You centers on a professional dancer who tours internationally. Han's films sometimes included the work of real life professional women. He dressed the characters in a female boss in outfits designed by Nora No, Korea's first uh, fashion designer. And he displayed them in widescreen long takes that allowed the viewer to admire them in full. Han's characters typically refuse to conform to the expectations of the men around them. The heroine of My Sister is a Hussy is a skilled judo practitioner who resists getting married and spends most of the film beating up men who annoy her, including a pair of men who sexually harass her in a park, that's one of them here, and her own husband when he asks her to hire his shirt, uh, to iron his shirt. So here she is grappling with him, tossing him, and there he is ending up on the ground. Um, his film, A Jealousy, even featured a lesbian character who seeks to create a home with her beloved and thereby save her from what she calls the slavery entailed in a marriage to a man. Han did not make films about the lives of typical Korean women who are more likely to be living rural lives of hardship in these years. He was more interested in capturing the cultural trends and shifting values visible in urban life. And he captured the aspirations of a modernizing society more than its mundane realities. His films offered a vision of a possible future rather than a commonly shared present. Han's films are ideologically complex rather than simple broadsides on behalf of women's emancipation. Many of them end with the female protagonist being punished in some way, dead or restored to the home and her proper position in a patriarchal family. This is the end of Madame Freedom when she's basically kneeling down before her husband. Scholars have typically, typically focused on these endings and read Han's films as fundamentally conservative and committed to restoring the status quo. I disagree. These endings are often quite brief, lasting not more than a few minutes, and they can't erase the preceding 90 minutes or so in which these women controlled the narrative and asserted their individuality. I take this ideological openness as a mark of Han's astute commercial sensibility. He made films that could appeal to a broad range of viewers, from those committed to women's emancipation to those who thought traditional Confucian gender roles were the heart of Koreanness and need, needed to be restored. Han was also a master stylist, which means that he used the tools of cinema with remarkable deftness and skill to express his ideas. My book is a cultural history of his style, which I approach as a period style. The book argues that Han's style was decisively shaped by the social, political, military, and economic conditions of the post-war period and that it shared certain features with the work of other cultural producers active at the same time, 
including film directors, magazine publishers, and advertisers of consumer goods. Han was exemplary, in other words, rather than wholly unique. My term for this period style is Cold War cosmopolitanism. This term seems at first to be something of an oxymoron since the Cold War, as it is conventionally understood, entailed dividing the world into separate blocks and policing the borders between them. But the Cold War was a force of international integration as well as division, and the binding together of the non-communist portions of the world encouraged Koreans to look beyond their national borders and understand themselves as connected to other people in Asia and the West. I propose that what emerged in 1950s Korea was a historically specific form of cosmopolitanism that was contingent upon the Cold War and dependent upon the transnational networks that it created. I'm thinking about Cold War cosmopolitanism as a cultural formation, one that was produced by Koreans and Americans working together and separately, and who were embarked on the shared project of modernizing South Korea. Cold War cosmopolitanism had four main dimensions. First, it was a political discourse about Korea's membership in free Asia and the larger free world, one that was deployed by both Korean and American leaders. This discourse encouraged an outward turn by Korean people and facilitated the forging of diverse networks of political, economic, and institutional ties with other non-communist people. Second, it was an optimistic attitude toward Western style modernity. It emphasized the opportunities that capitalist modernization was opening up and embraced the prospect of wide ranging social change. It suggested the need to shed the oppressive aspects of Korea's Confucian heritage and replace them with liberal Western values, especially individualism and freedom, which applied to women as well as men. As such, Cold War cosmopolitanism had a feminist dimension. Han's female characters embody this optimistic attitude towards social change, which was also embraced by feminist leaders such as Helen Kim, the president of EY University, and Lee Tae Young, Korea's first female lawyer. Third, Cold War cosmopolitanism was a material practice of cultural production and dissemination that was linked to Cold War institutions. The US State Department, the CIA funded Asia Foundation, and the regional network of US military bases created pathways through which all kinds of resources flowed into Korea and were used by Koreans to produce a wide variety of cultural products. The sets for Hand of Destiny, for instance, were constructed out of packing materials used in shipping and re relief supplies. Han used the processing facilities of a film studio created by the Asia Foundation. And some of his camera equipment, costumes, and decor most likely originated on the black market, which was supplied with goods smuggled in from J Japan and procured legally and illegally from US military bases. Other Cold War institutions, such as the Asian Film Festival, which was the brainchild of a Japanese film studio head, created pathways for the flow of Korean pr cultural production out of Korea and into free Asia. Han's films were regular entrants into this festival, and some of them, including a co-production with a Hong Kong company, were distributed in Southeast Asian markets. Cold War cosmopolitanism thus entailed the use of these Cold War resources and networks by Korean people in order to produce and disseminate their own works of culture. Finally, Cold War cosmopolitanism was a cultural style manifest in Korean films, magazines, fashion, musical performances, advertising, and home design. It entailed borrowing and localizing a range of stylistic elements derived from Western models. The influence of Hollywood techniques and conventions on Han's films is self-evident. And his films also incorporate things like music from Latin America and European inspired fashion. By demonstrating Koreans familiarity with Western cultural trends and showcasing the lifestyle promised by capitalist modernity, Cold War cosmopolitanism asserted that Koreans occupied the same cultural time as the modern West and was no longer the traditional or backward colony of Japanese imperial discourse. Paying close attention to Han Hyungmo's films brings a new body of work to the attention of film scholars and fans alike. It also allows us to see the 1950s as a distinct moment in Korea's history of modernization and recognize how it was decisively shaped, sometimes in unexpected ways, by the waging of the Cold War. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your work, uh, Christina. So um, I have a few questions for your work. Uh, 
uh, first question is, although you mentioned in your presentation though, um, uh, I'd like to hear more about your, how you were drawn to specifically Han hyung mo and his films in 50s, uh, rather than you know, other directors like Shin sang woo So um, my question is how you drawn to, uh, to this uh, specific film director and how you came to design this book project? Yeah, um, you know, I was really drawn. It was really the, um, you know, it was really the female characters that that drew me to his films, and um, and I was just there was great diversity in the stories about the female characters, but also they were just they were very unusual, and they were they struck me as incredibly modern in that sort of American liberal Western way that they were in that the films treated them really as individuals, um, and while I love. Um, Shin San Ok's Flower in Hell, um, you know, he also did a cycle of melodramas, women's pictures, but I found that there was a way in which there was, I found a much more genuinely conservative element in those films um, that I, you know, I'm never quite persuaded by the endings of Han Hyung Mo's films. Whereas I feel that Shin San Ok, those films are more suffused with a kind of, a, a little bit more of a patriarchal, patriarchal sensibility. Um, so, so that's really why I settled on Han's films. And I also was attracted because they, he hasn't received a lot of, cult of attention from scholars. You know, my book is the first monograph on him in either English or Korean. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. He's not included in the, the, the canon of Korean directors um, from that, from the post-war period. And I suspected that it was partly because he was um, so commercially successful that he had a very kind of glamorous Hollywood inflected style and, and maybe because of the way he focused on, on female characters um, in, instead of, you know, he wasn't making male melodramas, he was making women-centered melodramas. Um, also, um, adding that question, um, I'd like to hear more about how your uh, archival research experiences uh, during this book project uh, I think I found you have a lot of archive researchers like Korean Film Archive, uh, Harvard Yancheng, and National Archives and Records Administrations. So, uh, can well, you sure. The you know the um, after after watching Han's films, the archival research was really my favorite part of the project. Um, it was also the most most difficult. I'd never really done sort of gone to actual archives and done deep archival research before, um, and the project, you know, I don't read Korean, so um, I was kind of constrained in what I did. So I hired, I had a lot of translators, not a lot, several translators and research assistants who helped me. Um, and so the Korean Film Archive, since it doesn't have a lot of material in, um, in English, I did, uh, but they have these great oral histories that are all in Korean. So I had this fantastic undergraduate who was Korean and, and she aspired to be a Korean translator. And uh, she was a student of mine. And so I managed to get somebody in Korea to photocopy secretly, don't tell the Korean Film Archive, um, <laughs> a lot of these oral histories, which I wasn't supposed to really have um, and weren't supposed to be photocopied. And then, and she translated them all, like hundreds and hundreds of pages. So that was just an utter gold mine and insight into what was the, you know, cause there were the oral histories of filmmakers in the 1950s and, and talking about Han Yang Mo and his, the director in his film. So that was just fantastic. Um, and then in the, the, at the, at the, at NARA, the National Archives, the US National mm -hmm. Archives in Washington, DC, you know, again, there's just something, those where I was looking at a lot of US records and military records and State Department files. And that it's just really amazing, you know, you never get over the thrill. I certainly don't of just holding the documents in your hands. And it's like, wow, this was written in 1956. This was written in 1958 mm -hmm. and look at what they're talking about. And they're so explicit about some things. Um, and then it's also frustrating because they didn't have things that I also wanted. Um, I thought, well, of course you're just gonna have everything, every document, right? But of course that's not how archives work. They don't keep everything. Um, and then at Harvard, the Yenching Library was amazing because they have a lot of Korean government records from um, the 1950s that are bound together in books. And it's really interesting because those are um, in English or sometimes in English and Korean both. So I could, I could look at those and read those. And that was some of the first stuff I was looking at. And I was interested in 
and all the costuming and decor in Han Young Mo's films. And I was thinking like, how is this stuff even getting into Korea? Like, where is this stuff coming from? So I spent an enormous amount of time looking through import records from the 1950s and seeing, you know, how many Panama hats were being imported and how many purses were being imported. Um, and just trying to get a sense of what the material life uh, of, of, of the cities of Seoul was like in the 1950s. So the archival stuff was really, really fun and challenging at the same time, both. Okay, uh, thank you. I think it's a lot of work. I can't imagine how you deal with this all uh, archival researches. And my second question is, um, as your key concept in this book, you explaining Cold War cosmopolitanism through a new type of cinematic char character, Apregers, uh, whose presence was barely addressed in career related studies in US academia. So, uh, in my understanding, you are explaining Apregers as a cinematic woman character who were highly educated, sometimes not, and enjoyed the Western fashion and lifestyle. Uh, such as Madame O oh, in Madame Freedom. So uh, how, I like to hear more about how you see opera girls because I see the category of opera girls was very ambiguous in terms of their class and their status, education and family backgrounds. So um, my question is how you understand uh, Upraggers in between representation and everyday life in the fifties. Yeah, so the 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 Apray the girl. Um, this was that that sort of concept actually was discovered by one of my research assistants, my fabulous undergraduate student at BC, um, and she was the one who said, "Hey, there's this interesting term out here. Let me dig into this for you." Um, because it wasn't really in uh, English language scholarship at the time when I started the project, um, and it's a kind of a a little bit of a, I don't know, maybe a controversial term. I think that in its in Korean language scholarship and the way that it was used in the 50s, it's quite a negative term. Like it has very strong negative connotations. Um, and I wanted to um, I wanted to recuperate it a little bit um, as um, as a as a name for the sort of the post-war modern woman to distinguish her from the colonial era modern girl. Um, and to and to to say, yeah, there's a lot of she's often represented negatively, but it might be a mistake to take that negative representation at face value, um, and that someone like Madame O in Madame Freedom does a lot of things that are sort of morally objectionable. You know, she leaves her child at home and ignores him as well as her husband to go have an affair. Right? She's not she's not a morally sound character in that in that sense. Um, but I think that um, she's also doing things like asserting her own desire, asserting her own will, um, not putting her family before her, uh, asserting an, a sort of an existence apart from her family that I think was resonating in the 1950s, which was a period of tremendous change in women's lives. So I wanted to to take to just really question that assumption that the, the opera girl is always, you know, ultimately a conservative figure who is so awful that she ends up reinforcing patriarchal norms and say, let's look at her a little bit more closely and think about why she might have characters like this in it might have appealed to audiences and female viewers in particular, you know they probably weren't going to see all these movies just because they hated these characters so much, that there was something in them that was attractive. And so how do we dig out what was attractive for them, even when they're not presented as noble characters and heroic characters, um, which I think is kind of part of the point is like, here are some women who don't have to be noble, who don't have to be self-sacrificing, who don't have to be good. Um, and that's kind of interesting and remarkable just in and of itself. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, this is uh, this is my last question. This might be uh, very broad, though. Um, you already mentioned talked about the Han uh, Han Young Mo's film style and the Hollywood films uh, in the fifty. How they, they are uh, mutually or uh, influenced. But then uh, I like to ask how you think of think of recent rise of Korean films. In the United uh, in U.S. film industry and scholarships, so uh, as a film scholar in American studies, 
I couldn't be happier. Um, I couldn't be happier about the global success of Korean film. Honestly, it's thrilling to me. Um, you know, I love classical Hollywood, but I'm not a huge fan, frankly, of contemporary Hollywood. I don't like superhero movies. I don't like sequels. Um, and so I just, I love the fact that the Korean filmmakers have figured out a way to beat Hollywood basically at its own game. First in the Korean market, um, where they did, starting in the early 2000s, take back a, uh, their, their market share. And, um, and so they had a more dominant and stronger position in their own domestic market. Um, and then exporting, you know, being an export film industry. And, and that just, you know, Bong Joon-ho at the Oscars was just the pinnacle of everything. Um, I mean, he's just fantastic. He's such a charming guy. And you could see that he had utterly, he had charmed all of Hollywood because everybody just stood up and clearly loved him. Um, and, um, but I think it's a really complicated relationship. And, and Bong Joon-ho is a great example of that, that, um, you know, I think Korean film in the 50s and today is, is in really in conversation with Hollywood um, and is learning a lot from Hollywood and is figuring out how to do the things that Hollywood cinema does so well um, while telling Korean stories and having a Korean perspective and engaging with Korean history and, and, and social conditions and all that. Um, you know, Bong Joon-ho is, is genuinely an enormous fan of Hollywood films and and he grew up watching a lot of them. You know, he didn't grow up watching Madame Freedom. He didn't grow up watching Golden Age Cinema. He grew up watching, you know, the films of the Hollywood films of the 70s. So I think that it's a very, he's called it a love-hate relationship. And I think that that's, that's true in the 50s as well as it is today, that there's lots to learn from how Hollywood works. But um, I think Korean filmmakers have very much their own perspective and tell their own stories. And, um, and I think a lot of people are thrilled to hear that perspective. You know, Parasite was really genuinely very popular in the US. Um, so, you know, cheers to that. Okay. Um, so um, thank you, Christina, and uh, sharing for your work. And our next presenter is Suji Wu. She's associate professor of American studies at California State University Fullerton. Her articles have appeared in journals such as American Studies Journal, and she was the winner of the Mid-America American Studies Association Stone Sturman Prize for the best essay in American studies in 2017. Uh, her, uh, her first book, Framed by War, examines how Korean orphan, mixed race GI baby, adoptive birth mother, prostitute, and bride emerged at the heart of empire. It also chronicles how Americans went from knowing very little about Koreans uh, to making them family, and how Korean children and women who did not choose war found ways to navigate its aftermath of its South Korea, the United States, and the space in between. So uh, please welcome Professor Wu. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much to CCKS for having me here today. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Cho and Haekyung and Chu Hoon for organizing everything and making this possible. A special thank you to Alina Kim for whose book Adopted Territory is like the most among the most important in our field. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to do this. I am super excited to be here with Christina Klein. Um, you'll see. I did this on purpose, but their books are here. Um, they've been hugely influential for me and they are cited in my book. And I just feel really honored to be here today. And thank you to all of you for coming. I know this is probably your gazillionth Zoom this week. So I really appreciate you being here. It's really nice to be together. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So I wanted to start by, um, I wanted to start with a photograph here. Um, this is one of the few remaining photographs that my family has from Korea. And so you'll see in here, my dad is here and here's my mom and this is my older sister. And this is my grandma on my dad's side. And it was, a take, it was taken a few years before they came to the United States. And growing up, my parents never talked about the war. I knew that my mom was seven and my dad was 14 when the Korean War began, but it wasn't until I was in college and started to ask them about it that the story started to unfold. My mom told me about how her father, who was a police chief, 
was dragged from her home while she and her siblings hid above the rafters. She told me about her younger sister who died of lockjaw during the war and about her older sister who was taken by North Korean soldiers and she would never see any of them again. My dad told me about how he spent time on US military bases where American GIs gave him chewing gum and where he would rifle through the trash at the end of the day to find weathered copies of Look and Life magazine. And he told me how he fell in love with Elvis and American cars. And it was in this moment amidst all of the violence, chaos and hunger that his American dream began. One thing that was made clear through their stories was the life altering impact of the war. And this project was born from me wanting to know more about the many others who had also survived this war. I started research on this book when I was in grad school where I used to sit in the library stacks and search for whatever I could find about Korea beginning with US occupation in 1945 and going through the 1960s. And one thing that I kept seeing in every book or pamphlet or magazine or newspaper article was the figure of the Korean child. There were statistics that marked their health, numbers that spoke to their homelessness, photographs of them dressed in miniaturized US military uniforms. And I wondered why it was that the Korean child was so central to US narratives about this war. I conducted research in the US and South Korea, and it was when I visited wartime orphanages in Korea that I came to understand that the questions that I had about Korean children could not be separated from what happened to Korean women. And this is how my book came to center upon Korean women and children. And for the remainder of my talk, I wanted to highlight some of the arguments that I make in each of the chapters. But before I do this, I wanted to give some facts about this forgotten war. The war lasted for three years between 1950 and 1953, and it's still not technically over. There was an armistice that ended the fighting, but not the war. It claimed an estimated 34,000 American, 900,000 Chinese, and over 3 million Korean lives. The majority of these were civilian deaths. While technically the United Nations fought in Korea, the United States made up 90% of the UN troops. And during the war, the US had dropped 635,000 tons of bombs on the peninsula, which is about the size of Minnesota. US violence in Korea deeply hampered American efforts to promote visions of democracy during the Cold War. And to allay domestic and international criticism, the US military and government made numerous efforts, one of which included the production of imagined family frames that positioned Americans as caregivers of Korean children in need. And this is the topic that I take up in part one of the book. In chapter one, I look at how US military officials actively put US servicemen in contact with Korean children. And if you look at the army chaplain logs, they take a, um, they write down the schedule of what its men are doing every day. And if you look at that log, you see that there are scheduled into the activities of the servicemen are visiting an orphanage donating goods that were um, donated by Americans, bringing these goods to different orphanages. They had during the holidays, the children would put on shows for the American GIs. And these mandated interactions inter uplifted the spirits of American GIs and gave them a purpose in this war. But there were other reasons for this pairing. The Department of Defense sent cameramen to capture these tender moments and then supplied these images to various news outlets. And here's an example. This is from a Universal Newsreel in 1952. And the first half of the newsreel shows American tanks and planes dropping bombs. And the second half shows this. The bombs were collected by the Marine Corps League in many American cities. And don't think all oh, those things Korean youngsters. With help from friendly American Marines, a new dress goes over just fine. So this blend of military might and humanitarian aid were typical of the kinds of images that the Department of Defense would film and that you'd end up seeing in US media. It was a way to display powerful US war technology and then cover over the destruction caused by these same machines by showing how American GIs cared for Korean children. In chapter two, I look at how average American civilians were also positioned as rescuers of Korean children, in part by looking at the American Korean Foundation that sponsored the Korean Children's Choir. In 1954, 25 children who were between the ages of six and 12 toured 50 American cities and sang to sold out audiences. So they performed at the White House. You see here, they performed at the Statue of Liberty. Um, they were on TV. There is that show, Name That Tune. So the children appeared on that show. They had a record 
here that you see with Urania Records. And again, this was also geared towards helping with fundraising efforts. And they were a source of pride for Korea as well. President Syngman Rhee felt that, the, um, that unlike waif imagery that circulated during the war, the choir promoted images of Korean resilience, democracy, and potential for eventual independence. And the choir goes on to raise over $10 million for post-war recovery. And during the tour, it was constantly emphasized that these children were double orphans, that they had in fact lost both of their parents in the war. And as a result, there were many Americans who tried to adopt the children, but they couldn't because there was no official protocols for transnational adoptions at this time. In part two, I look at how these imagined international families became actual families. And I examined the work of US missionaries and other transnational adoption advocates who pushed for permanent adoption laws. Two of the missionaries that I consider are Harry and Bertha Holt, who you see here. This is Harry and here's Bertha. Um, they were fervent Christians who spoke publicly and often about the plight of mixed race children in Korea. In 1955, the Holts adopted eight mixed race Korean children. And in 1956, they established the Holt Adoption Program. The confluence of these efforts, oh, um, and the Holtz also worked very closely with President Rhee, who in 1953 ordered a directive to send all quote unquote half American children to the quote unquote land of their fathers. The confluence of these efforts and a series of accompanying adoption laws opened the path to adoptions from Korea. So between 1953 and 1965, over 6,000 Korean adoptees came to the United States. While in the 1950s, an estimated 70%, and some even put the number higher, of adoptees from Korea were of mixed race parentage, US media centered primarily on full-blooded Korean children when sharing news of these overseas adoptions. Korean adoptees were often depicted as rapidly Americanizing model children. And here you see Ri kang Yong, who appeared during the war in war relief posters for wartime fundraising, and then was later adopted by a white American widow. In 1956, this is when he first arrived to the United States and life was on hand to capture his first day on American soil. And it shows him wearing this gingham shirt and doing all these American things. He's riding a carousel, he's talking on the phone and watching television. Model narratives like these supplanted the trauma experienced by these children. And in case studies, you see these these kinds of reports that explain how um, there, there are cases of children chanting that they wanted to go home to Korea, cases of children who were uncontrollably crying and would not stop crying. Um, there was another case who a child who refused to eat rice was interpreted as a sign of adjustment as opposed to a possible sign of homesickness. And in these ways, model narratives about Korean adoptees didn't allow for the loss and trauma experienced by these children. In the final part of the book, rather than look at the families that were produced, I consider the families that were broken apart. I look at the Koreans who lay permanently outside of acceptable family frames. In chapter five, I examine how American missionaries and social workers often coerced Korean mothers to give up their mixed race children. Um, so they would bring Korean translators. They would also bring along photographs of happily placed mixed race children in America to try and convince the mothers to relinquish their children. And many mothers tried to raise their children even amidst the extreme discrimination in Korea. The women often hid and cared for their children as long as they could, which meant that when they could no longer do so, the children were older, eight or 10 years old, which made separation that much harder. This chapter also examines how mixed race children had to undergo US racializing processes in South Korea in order to uphold the black white color line in the United States. And so this is one of the child reports from Holt Agency in Seoul. And it included a spot for the administrator to describe the child's skin color and whether the child appeared lighter or darker than the attached photograph of the child. There were check boxes for administrator, administrators to denote the color and texture of the child's hair and the color of their eyes. Administrators were instructed to inspect the nail beds and scrotums of infants to determine what color the child would become when older. And these invasive US racializing practices were brought into and implemented in Korea to assure that Korean white children were placed with white couples and that Korean black children were placed with black couples. In the final chapter, I center upon Korean women. 
during the war, Korean brides, um, like the, um, like she was nicknamed Blue here, Korean brides were a novelty. And like most, like model Korean adoptees, they carried the potential to communicate Cold War narratives of internationalist exchange. And you can see that here, the, the in-laws exchange clothes. Um, you see here that she's, um, you know, learning how to cook her, her new husband's uh, favorite gravy. So you see this here. Um, but after the war, when the peninsula remained divided and over 70,000 US servicemen were still stationed in South Korea, it became clear that Korean brides would make up a steady source of immigration. And to date, there are over 100,000 Korean military brides in the United States. Um, sorry, went too fast. Um, further complicating the image of Korean military brides in the 1950s and 60s was that these women were associated with US militarized prostitution in South Korea. And as a result of these factors, US public no acknowledgement of Korean military brides was supplanted by safer versions. And here's one of them. One of these safer representations came in the form of the Kim sisters. And this is actually, they were two sisters and a cousin. So this is cousin Mia, and these two are sisters, Aija and Sue. But I think for marketing purposes, it couldn't be like the Kim sisters and their cousin. So they were known as the Kim sisters. Um, so they started singing for US troops when they were children during the war. And a US agent discovered them in Korea and brought them to Las Vegas in 1959. And they were a huge hit. They appeared on Ed, the Ed Sullivan show, 25 times um, and they were they appeared on TV quite often. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of their performance uh, when they performed on Hollywood Palace. And they were introduced as these multi-talented sisters who could play 20 instruments, so. All right, so I wish we could watch more. Um, and it, you know, so here they're playing the marimba. They also played the bagpipes. They were really fantastic. Um, but in, in media, in addition to be de being described as being multi-talented, they were also described as being innocent virginal sisters. And so in one interview, someone asked Sukja, who was the oldest, you know, what do you do when stage door Johnny's come and ask you out after the shows? And she says, oh, I tell them that my little sisters have to come with me and then they kind of leave me alone. So there was this whole persona that they had um, in media. And when you look in um, their representation, so this is from Life Magazine in 1960s, they were presented in this kind of duality. You know, in some photographs and in some imagery, they are kind of akin to model adoptees. They were also in a television show called Ansign O'Toole where they were raising money for Korean orphans. And so this um, association with Korean adoptees, you, you see that um, occasionally when you look at their representations. So here they're watching television, they have their hair pulled back in ponytails, but then they were also hypersexualized um, as well. And in 1967, all three women were married to white men and they faded from the spotlight. Part of their popularity relied upon the script of the Virginal Sister Act. And this could no longer be sustained once they were interracially married. For all of the images that Americans produced of Korean children and women, there were many more stories that unfolded outside of the frame. And I wanted to end with one of these images that we can't see. When conducting research, I came across many photographs that could not be published. In one case file was a photograph of a Korean mother and her 12 year old child, a boy whose black American GI father had started the process of adopting him, but ultimately wasn't able to. And social welfare workers were searching for another quote unquote suitable Negro couple to adopt the child, even though the Korean birth mother told the agency that she didn't want to send her son to anyone but his biological father. So I'd like to read just a few sentences from the book where I describe this photograph. The child sits awkwardly on his mother's lap in front of a backdrop of painted flowers. They wear their best clothes, the mother in a hanbok and the boy in a sweater and coveralls. She stares directly at the camera and he looks off to the side, neither smile. The studio setting suggests that this marked some kind of an occasion, but the deep concern on both of their faces intimate that it was not a happy one. Did this photo mark the last time that they would see one another? Was this photo taken as a keepsake for the mother to remember him by?
The photograph could not contain the weight of circumstances that surrounded them, from the absent father to the non-home setting, to the quiet stillness, to the deep sadness, the picture was missing all of the expected markers of a family photograph. It was a broken family frame. And these are the kinds of unseen images that I feel are important for us to do the work of imagining. They remind us that it was through the Korean War that violence and humanitarianism came to support one another. U.S. bombs created victims in need of rescue and U.S. aid provided cover for ongoing American intervention. And my hope with this book is to make transparent how it was that violence and care came together to further U.S. aims and to unravel this pairing so that empire has nowhere to hide. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you for sharing your work, Susie. Thank you. Uh, as a responder of this book, I'd like to introduce Elena Kim. She's associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at UC Irvine. She's the author of Adapted Territory, Transnational Korean Adaptives and Politics of Belonging, which received the Social Science Book Award from the Association for Asian American Studies in 2012. Please welcome uh, Professor Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Hegyang. Thank you, everyone. Um, before I begin, um, I want to inform everyone that the Q&A function is where one should ask, you post your questions. Um, and I'm also cognizant of the time. I think we're ending at 1.15. So um, is that right, Hegyang? Anyway, I think it's 1.15. So I'm not yes. gonna go, I'm not gonna take up too much time, but because um, I do wanna leave time for questions. Um, but I think, you know, Susie, thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was such a nice way to um, provide visual uh, examples from the book. And there are many images in the book, which are wonderful. But, you know, I have some familiarity with a few of the archives that you worked with, and there's so much more. <laughs> so one thing I actually wanted to ask you was, um, were there any specific things that you wish you could have included in the book? that you located in the archives that just you couldn't find a place for, that didn't either fit into your framework or that you know you just you know couldn't um, you know for reasons of word count and et cetera. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, there were so many and there were so many photographs that of course I would never show because the photographs that I included are all ones that were published. And there were so many photographs, you know, the registry photographs from the orphanages in Korea you know, those, the images of those children who a lot of them are, they, their eyes are all puffy from having just cried. I mean, these are very different kinds of images than what the US public was seeing at this time. And so those things I wouldn't want to show, but there were also things that I wanted to talk about in some way in this book. And one kind of big piece that I found that I couldn't find a way to fit into this book and that I might try to do something more with later is I found this archive. Um, it was in the Yale Divinity Library of the Korean, it was called the Korean Crippled Children's Home. And this was a US missionary run home for disabled children. And it opened in 1959 in Korea. And so I had found that before I went to Korea. And then when I went to Korea, I went to the Severance Hospital, which was the hospital that was associated with this, um, with this organization. And I found even more materials. And so, you know, one of the things that was really fascinating about that is that they were looking for American donors to support the livelihood of these children who were not adoptable. So these were children because of their physical impairments, they were not eligible for adoption to the United States. And so they were destined to stay in Korea. But what was striking to me is that all of those uh, processes that were put in place by orphanages to prepare children who were going to be sent to America, um, the things like Bible study, how to pray, um, how to organize your day, how to exercise your body, all of these things that were put in place for the children who were destined, who were scheduled to come to America, were also put in place for the children who were going to remain in Korea 
And so all of these kinds of disciplinary processes and also Americanizing processes, you know, you could see one of the things they did is I found all these letters that they would send to their donors and it would include a schedule of their day of you, they wake up at eight, they brush their teeth, they have their breakfast, they do physical therapy. Um, there's a lot to be said about American prosthetics and the different kinds of devices that were being used by these children. Um, and then they have Bible study and then playtime. It was so structured and the prayers and lights out. And so when I see that kind of structuring, it makes me think about how, you know, Korea may not have been an official US colony, but all of those structures that are put in place to create a good subject, those were implemented and you could really see it in something like the Korean Crippled Children's Center. That was one big thing that I wanted to talk about, but I couldn't. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure there, there are many, many others. Um, but one thing that that reminded me of is a point in your book where you talk about uh, adoption in particular as a kind of transnational biopolitics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that comes out clearly in the example that you just gave as well, where, you know, we can think about it working not just in terms of, um, you know, when adoptees arrived in the U.S. and the kinds of um, forms of disciplining and acculturation, et cetera, that were mediated through institutions, but also in the reverse. And uh, you know the ways that social workers were going to Korea in order to modernize it, but also kind of um, installing certain norms yeah. that were also embraced by the South Korean state because it was kind of promoting the kind of rapid modernization that uh, it thought was you know should should be the goal yeah. of uh, the nation. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you really see it in the institutions. So, you know, by the time you get to the 1960s in Korea, the social wel welfare system of Korea is the social welfare system of the United States. I mean, they, so the legacies of, you know, what began as US missionary work, but then became, you know, US social workers who are in Korea for this purpose, it has, um, it's still there. <laughs> um, it's still there. It's still so embedded in the institutional structure of Korea, as is this, you know, you see it in, and you see it in the bride schools as well, you know, this project of creating the right kind of immigrant, that project begins in Korea before the brides arrive to the United States. Um, and you see it in like the structuring of the US military too. I mean, I, I can't, I need to do more research on World War II, but from how I see it, I feel like this relationship where the child is, um, central to the work of servicemen and women abroad, I really think that that becomes structured and institutionalized in Korea. And so, you know, I was listening to Serial, that Serial podcast, the season two, um, and one of the interviewees, he said, you know, I spent more time in Afghanistan passing out crayons to kids at school than I did in combat. You know, and this idea of, you know, the humanitarian aid that the servicemen and women are supposed to be bringing to the children of wherever the US military is at that moment. I mean, I really think that that kind of structuring gets solidified in Korea. Um, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And I think I think in Hart and Negri's book on war, they talk about uh, positive biopolitics and humanitarianism mm -hmm. uh, as being a mark of US empire, but in a you know, in a more contemporary moment, where, whereas I totally agree with you. But the other thing it makes me uh, think about is how, when you look at, you know, it, social work as an export in the post-Korean War uh, setting and installing certain norms of social work and family and, you know, what welfare should look like, particularly when it comes to children, it's super ironic now because those norms have pretty much stayed the same in South Korea, whereas they have radically changed in the US. Like social work is a very radical discipline now. And so the kinds of liberalization um, or the different kinds of, you know, the, the ways that these forms have liberalized in the US now allows Western social workers to go to Korea and say, oh, this reminds me of 1950s America. And it's like, well, of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it also inscribes a certain teleological narrative moderni of modernization that actually misreads the norms in South Korea as Confucian mm -hmm. when they're actually, you know, norms that had been implemented, as you say, by the social, by the American social workers mm -hmm. at that time. So I feel like there's, there's so much more to kind of critique, 
around that particular encounter that has had all these other ramifying effects to the present, which includes a lot of, you know, American trained social workers who are themselves adopted from Korea, mm -hmm. who are saying, hey, Korea, let's, <laughs> you know, let's ask more critical questions about why adoption still continues. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh, that's such, it's such a good point. And, you know, it, um, there was this organization called CAVA, it was like, um, I'm forgetting what it stands for, but they were American voluntary associations. Yeah. yeah. Voluntary agency. So, you know, US and Korean uh, people who are thinking about how, and in the 60s, they were talking about this and they're like, this is a problem. You know, we've become so reliant that we haven't even come up with our own systems. And because we haven't, you know, well, granted, there was the crisis of the war, but we're in the 60s now. And so we should really think of solutions that work for us. And they were already lamenting the fact that it had already become so embedded, but you're so right about it being stuck in this, you know, Western social work of the fifties and sixties and not moving, you know, not changing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then being read as Confucian, which really annoys. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> anyway, I see Joe here. Does this mean that we're entering into a Q and a period? I, I don't want to uh, I want to give you all the time you need, but, um, Oh, there's plenty uh, else that I could say if there are no questions, but I, maybe it's a good time to switch over. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, there, was the one question was just very, it just gives me an opportunity to read the titles of the books again. Um, the, the first book is by Christina Klein, uh, Cold War Cosmopolitanism, Period Style in 1950s Korean Cinema. And the second book by Susie Wu is Framed by War, Korean Children and Women at the Crossroads of U.S. Empire. Um, I maybe I could direct the first question to Christina. Um, she, you mentioned during your, uh, uh, the synopsis of your book, uh, a kind of uh, a, a very com uh, a compelling point that would, that, um, you know, the implication was that your starting point uh, for, uh, you know, thinking about this, per this particular Korean director and this particular moment in the 1950s, is, a, is in large ways a departure um, from thinking about the, the many ways that Korean film has been historicized. Um, you know, post-war Korean film has been historicized at the point of origin. And I wonder if, you know, you could talk a little bit more about that. And, and, and is there a way in which your intervention um, helps us rethink uh, maybe the ways we uh, uh, think of, canonically think of, of Korean cinema? Hmm. I'm not, not quite sure how to answer that um, in terms of that sort of what exactly you mean by how it's been historicized in Korean scholarship. Um, I think there's there's often um, a kind of privileging of social realism as because it has a kind of critical dimension. Um, uh, it turns a critical eye towards society. And I think so that, um, you know, fits with scholars tendency to think critically about what was going on. Um, and, and so a film like um, Aimless Bullet, Obaltan becomes the, the, the canonical post-war uh, work. I, I, it wasn't, I don't think it was particularly popular with Koreans at the time. So, which isn't to say that it, it's not an important film, but there's different ways in which you can evaluate like scholars, um, you know, because a work is very popular doesn't always mean that scholars want to look at it and think about it. And I'm always drawn to films that are very popular. I want to know why they're, why they're popular. Um, and so that's, I think, has sometimes been held against Han Young Mo, maybe that his very popularity and his lack of, you know, he's not critical. He's like, wow, like, look at these great clothes and look at these shoes and look at this purse and, you know, look at these electrical appliances. Like he's very celebratory of, uh, of that kind of Western style modernity and the sort of capitalist modernity and the consumer culture and material culture that comes with it. Um, and I think that that, I think scholars say, to, you know, don't find that very interesting, um, which is fine. No pro I have no problem with that. I find it kind of interesting. Um, so maybe that's a sort of a point of difference. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, I'm realizing this is a wonderful pairing of, of scholars as well, because you both are really, um, I mean, it's supremely gifted in the archive and with archival materials and, and use the archive in really kind of interesting ways. So the, the, the next question is for, uh, for Professor Wu. Um, the question is, I'm curious as to uh, how Dr. Wu's journey toward this subject began. I'd also like to know if Dr. Wu has any thoughts on how television was util utilized as a symbol of assimilation and Americanness, particularly when television 
was just starting to emerge and proliferate, proliferate in the US as well. Okay, um, great. So this journey began because I was always so surprised that my parents never talked to me about the Korean War. So it just came from the silence that I grew up with. And then it's, I think they waited for me to get older to tell me these stories because a lot of them are really terrible and heartbreaking. And so I knew that, you know, I started to hear these stories when I, um, I was actually went to UC Irvine, yeah, my alma mater. Um, so when I was an undergrad <laughs> <laughs> my parents live in Arcadia, so I'd go home on the weekends because I was always homesick. And so I'd go home on the weekends and I would talk to them. And all of a sudden, you know, I was taking these Korean classes and I was like, I want to know about all this stuff. And I think that, you know, the impetus for this, of course, was that there was so much, you know, trauma and pain surrounding their experiences with the war. And I felt like there just wasn't enough out there on the Korean War. There were these political and military histories, but I really wanted to write some kind of a social history. I didn't know what the topic was going to be, which is why I used to just sit in the library stacks and just pull everything I could just to see what was, try and get it, you know, gauge what was happening at that time. And so that's, that I think was, a, you know, my parents' experience was, I think, a huge part of, of this. And I was born here and, you know, I just wanted to know more about Korea. So there were a lot of reasons as to why I wanted to why I ended up here. Um, and then your question about TV is, is really great. I mean, this goes to um, Christina Klein's book, Cold War Orientalism, which has been so <laughs> important for me. But, you know, to think about how these representations, whether they're through film or TV, it creates these ideas that are Cold War lessons. You know, Korea is our neighbor. Um, you know, the Korean War did not end well. And so it was a way to kind of recoup the losses of that war, but also as a way to present these very Cold War internationalist ideals of look at our talented neighbors. Um, you know, all the performances, the Korean Children's Choir and the Kim Sisters, they were all singing and dancing, which, you know, makes me think about K-pop. But, you know, it they were all um, very, they were a way to introduce Americans to a certain version of Koreans, a safe version of Koreans, because they were also, of course, coming to America. So as immigrants who are part of these interracial families, I mean, a, a lot of cultural work had to be done to make that okay, to make it okay that there were these Korean children and mixed race Korean children who are being brought into white and black families, Korean military brides who are being brought in by US military men. You know, there was, this is the 1950s. So there was a lot of sense that had to be made about who these people were. And these were very safe constructions. It was always women and children, um, you know, that was, that you would see on TV. So I think that it was very much part of this larger project of, you know, promoting these visions of American democracy and America as a racial democracy too. I think that that was really important as well. Thanks for the question. Um, there was a, another, uh, just a small question about um, the Kim sisters and uh, just, it's sort of what eventually happened to the Kim sisters. Um, yeah. And I just maybe use that as an opportunity to just talk a little bit more about them. It's a really interesting story. It makes me think of Christina's category from her first book, um, Middle Brow Culture. You know, it just it, like that, it, it seems solidly middle brow in some kind of way. Yeah. It absolutely does. So they were, um, you know, they were huge. When they came to Las Vegas, they were part of this show called China Doll Review. <laughs> so it was like all these Asian women. And then they were like, they were often dressed in chong sams. Um, and so uh, sometimes a lot of times they would wear their hanboks. There are numbers where they would start in their hanboks and play the kayagum. And then they would literally strip on stage and then they would be wearing a tight chong sam um, underneath and, you know, continue. And then they would start singing American songs. And so they, you know, they were here for this show in Las Vegas, but then they started to get booked in other hotels. And then they ended up becoming, you know, they had records and appeared on television. And then in 1967, all three of them get married and none of them to a US serviceman. One gets married to someone who's Austrian. Um, they all marry men who are Anglo. And so this, and when you listen to interviews with them, they say, oh, well, it just became really hard to perform and to travel because now we were married and then soon they had kids. And so they, there are these reasons as to why it became difficult. But I can't help but think that part of, you know, they all get married in 1967. And this is the moment when they kind of fade 
fade, their popularity fades. And there are a lot of reasons for this, but I can't help but think that one of the contributing reasons is because they were this fantasy of, you know, this virginal sister act. And all of a sudden, they're, as soon as they marry white men, they are suddenly kind of more like the military brides in terms of public consciousness. Um, and Mia talks about how, you know, they ended up kind of going their separate ways a little bit. And the two older sisters, so Aija and Sukja ended up joining the Kim brothers. And there was this like Kim brothers act that wasn't nearly as popular as the Kim sisters. And they performed a little bit in the 60s and I think maybe into the early 70s, I'm not sure, but they weren't quite as popular. And then they only did that for a little bit and then um, they weren't a part of the Kim brothers anymore either. So they're really, really fascinating. And there's a great oral history um, university of, at University of Nevada. It's, you could access it. You can email me, <laughs> I'll send it to you. It's a really great interview um, with them. Elena, did you, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, actually, uh, talking about oral histories and this, you know, Christina mentioned her oral histories that she kind of got under the <laughs> table. <laughs> uh, and then I also noticed in Susie's book that, um, that you did some oral histories as well, interviews with some of the elder, elderly folks who had worked in the adoption system. Um, so I suppose, I mean, I'm curious, both with Christina, like if you plan to share those translations, cause it seems like they could be super, you know, uh, valuable for other scholars, but also you Susie for, you know, this is a kind of generation that's quite elderly now, and it might be really valuable to have those perspectives in part because I think that, you know, for those of you who aren't aware, there's a field called critical adoption studies, which has formed over the past decade or so among folks who study mostly transnational adoption, mostly adoption from Korea. So, you know, this, these are, and many of these scholars have also been adopted from Korea. So there's a strong, like the critical part is mostly critical of the heteronormative nuclear kind of familial ideologies that underwrite transnational adoption and the humanitarian discourses, but also of state power. And so one thing that I found really interesting in Susie's book was um, this particular moment when, you know, South Korean state uh, projects around adoption weren't quite fully fledged as a kind, as the, as the way it's known now, primarily based on like the Park Chung hee and Chandu Wan administrations, which were really about just like removing excess population, treating children as disposable. Um, so, whereas in the, I think in the 50s and early 60s, you see more uh, ambivalence uh, and possible, you know, and um, kind of more um, interest on the part of the South Korean state to try to protect children even after they leave. So, um, so I, I feel as if, you know, some of these oral histories may also provide more nuance and more texture to that period in terms of what Koreans were thinking they were doing when they were sending children abroad. So it's, there's sort of a general question about oral histories and, and archiving and then, uh, you know, that comment about that period. So. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I wish I could share those translations, but those oral histories aren't mine to share. So I can't, I, would, I wish the Korean Film Archive would have them sort of translated and, and made them accessible because they're just an unbelievable resource. And I think, you know, Korean oral histories are really important now because people are getting old and dying. And, you know, one of what I was thinking of a project was the Korean Grandmothers Project, right? It's like everybody go interview their grandmother who was alive in the 50s and like, what was it like? And what movies did you go see? And what was urban life like? And where did you shop? And what did you think about the black market? Like all these questions that we're never gonna be able to answer if people don't go and interview their grandmothers. Um, but I also just wanna say, you know, the Kim sisters, I love the Kim sisters and they're getting a lot of attention now, which is fantastic, they deserve it. Um, and they're a really interesting example of the sort of this sort of Cold War networks, right? Cold War cosmopolitanism network networks that the US military creates. And the, and the military as a kind of a cultural institution in Korea is very interesting because of course they started out as military entertainers in eighth army shows entertaining US troops. That's where they learn how to be these kind of Americanized performers 
And then that's what takes them out of Korea and into the US and onto um, American TV and American stages. So it's that it's, you know, the military is a cultural conduit of bringing things, American things and other national cultures into Korea, but also taking Korean stuff out of in, and spreading it around the world. So I think there's a real cultural history of the military that um, in Korea that can really be written as well. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I completely agree. Um, and Elaine, so this project, when I was in, when it started as a dissertation, I'll try to keep this short because I know we're over time. Um, this project actually started as an oral history project. And so I had gone through human subjects and I had um, found, I was interested in interviewing adoptees who came to the US in the 50s and 60s. And so they were much older and I did contact, um, I was in, in conversation with five uh, people who came in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, and the reason why I changed directions is because I got a phone call from the spouse of one of the adoptees who I was trying to contact. And she called me and said, I just want to let you know that my husband received your letter, but you're probably never going to hear from him because he doesn't even talk to me about this. It's like, it brings back a lot of really painful memories for him. And so I just want, I didn't want to not respond, but I wanted to let you know why it is that you're probably not going to hear from him. And it was, it was that phone call that um, I started to think about my parents. And then I started to think like, maybe this isn't my, my place. I started to really worry about, you know, whether it was, it was going to be too painful for me to talk to these people who were in their sixties and seventies at this point. Um, and so I changed, I changed directions. And then I thought, well, there's actually so much about this that I don't know or, or understand. And so I, I went and did the archival work and I ended up interviewing people who worked in orphanages um, in Korea. And um, I would, maybe, maybe I should transcribe them. I mean, um, I have them all, it was like so long ago that I did this, it was pre iPhone and all those things. So my recordings are on those little tapes, but I, I have them. Um, so, but that's a really great idea because I agree oral histories are such an important resource. Um, and the more we have access to them, the, the better questions we can ask and the better we can understand. So thank you. Uh, I am afraid that we are out of time. Um, so uh, I please join me in thanking um, our panelists. At this point, our panelists would hear a rousing applause, but unfortunately, you can't hear that. Um, and invite the audience to join us uh, next week on Tuesday and then Friday um, for uh, more talks about Dave Fedman's book, uh, Liz Masson's book, and Yu Jong Oh's book. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.